the People's Platform. Good evening and welcome to the show. Unveiling the 2024 budget earlier today, President Ranil Vikramasinghe, in his capacity as Finance Minister, pledged his commitment to identify shortcomings encountered uh, in the journey thus far and to rectify them. How will budget 2024 impact the growing uh, crises in the health sector? How do we go about averting uh, this growing crisis in health? Let's find out by talking to Dr. Vinya Aryaratna, President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Good evening and welcome, Dr. Vinya. Good evening, Sonali. Good to have you here with us. Same here to be here. <laughs> um, Dr. Vinya, let's first talk about uh, Budget 2024. It's a bit too early to analyze all the figures, all the implications on the health sector. Um, some of um, what was told this morning uh, was that guidelines will be issued and a separate institution will be established for the medicine procurement process. Uh, and that medical research will be upgraded to international standards by strengthening laboratory services. I'd like your feedback on um, this issue of a separate institution being established for the medicine procurement process uh, because currently there is a methodology that has been stipulated uh, with checks and balances. So talk to us about this new concept, if you can help us decipher. Yes, uh, thank you, Sonali. I think uh, I haven't still read the exact wordings how the, the budget proposal is uh, formulated, but uh, I think first I'll comment on the uh, identification of shortcomings in the health sector and the president's commitment to address. I think that, that we welcome. The shortcomings are already identified. The solutions are also there. So I hope that this, uh, this commitment is to really implement the solutions that have been already proposed by all professional organizations including the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Now coming to this uh, recommendation or the budget proposal uh, to have a separate agency for procurement. Now again uh, I am not sure of the details of it but as you said the National Medicines Regulatory Authority and also the normal procurement guidelines are there. But we all know the past two and a half years all these guidelines have not been uh, uh, followed and there had been serious violations and exceptions given, uh, exemptions uh, uh, such as the wavering of registration and so on. Mm -hmm. And if those regulations have been adhered to, I don't think there is a need for a separate procurement uh, agency only for the health sector or the mini uh, for uh, drug procurement or medical supplies. Um, now, what has happened is that uh, the uh, procedure or that entire cycle of uh, identifying the quantities or the kinds of medicines that are required and the and the quantities and also placing orders, all these things have. Uh, been undermined that whole procurement uh, standards practices have, have not been followed therefore we ended up in a situation where poor quality drugs and also shortages of medicines have uh, really plagued the entire health sector and we have seen the uh, preventable deaths as well as uh, so many complications mm -hmm. uh, to the to the patients so i think the commitment to correct the procurement uh, the deficiencies in the procurement uh, process uh, is I think commendable, but uh, in principle I do not think we can agree, uh, we cannot understand the rationale and we have serious concerns if uh, such a separate agency is to be set up because it will take time also and now we are in an emergency situation where we, re we really need to rectify mm -hmm. uh, this situation and have quality affordable medicines in the system. So, by having a separate agency, I do not think we can address that issue. Okay. Um, over the past few weeks, we have seen shifts being made to uh, those at the helm of the Ministry of Health as well as the National Medicine Regulatory Authority, the NMRA. How will these shifts result in um, the country being able to chart its course um, towards averting uh, this growing uh, crisis in health? Yeah, Sonali, I think uh, it is important to recognize that uh, this crisis, the origin of this cri crisis or the root cause of this crisis is, a, is related to governance. Of course, the larger governance issues are there, but in the health sector we know uh, there has been serious uh, concerns with regard to the way the health sector was managed both at a, at a kind of a political level and also at an administrative level and particularly in relation to 
uh, drug procurement and the entire functioning operations of the National Medicines Regulatory Authority. So, one can say that okay, just changing heads will not uh, change the system, mm. but I think we have had a very robust system, very reliable system and people had trust in that system. They knew that if you go to a government hospital, the medicine that they were getting was not of poor quality. They, they had, I mean, they knew that it was quality medicine and in, even the doctors did not have any hesitation in prescribing medicines in that system. So, that trust was breached. So, when you lose confidence, it is very difficult to restore. So, by having changes at the top, it also gives a very strong message that the government wants this to be now uh, th there has to be a remedy and then that is the first uh, uh, sort of important response. So, we have to give time and we have full confidence in the leadership of the uh, NMRA and, uh, and of course, the minister has al already sort of pledged certain things and I hope the minister will follow uh, what he had already pledged and uh, I think we the people also have to hold the system accountable. Uh, to, to deliver, I mean that is that has also uh, been uh, lagging. I think uh, we, we have to uh, make all the government institutions and also these, uh, these other agencies uh, such as NMRA really accountable and following these procedures. So, we have uh, confidence that the new leadership in the NMRA uh, will uh, adhere to those guidelines because we have been they have also been part of our own SLMA efforts during the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So, we, we are confident that, uh, uh, that things will change and also uh, the um, uh, we, we welcome those changes. Uh, if we are to talk about health governance, which you um, briefly spoke about, the recently released IMF uh, governance diagnostic report as well as the uh, governance diagnostic report uh, released civil by civil society, including TISL, um, both yeah. allude to the urgent need to address issues in the health sector. Um, how must this be done in a streamlined, cohesive manner? So, one of the general recommendations is to make the procurement processes very transparent and also uh, the, uh, the uh, disclosures, right? Uh, by, by now, if you look at India, they, they have a dashboard where public can access and see for which kind of supplies government uh, you know requirements uh, have been uh, open for bids who have bidded their previous uh, sort of uh, credentials and all that mm -hmm. and also including the, the the companies that have been blacklisted okay now have you ever heard of companies in any any sort of government uh, supply uh, uh, mechanisms uh, who have been blacklisted so, so this is the problem. So, I think what is required is that uh, even the IMF uh, uh, report requires that uh, you know uh, to have a transparent system, and within a, it's a, it's a time bound. I think the government has to establish that, and that will avoid uh, without having you know paper um, kind of uh, proposals uh, proposals based on paper and you know have submissions uh, through a information communication technology uh, system. Uh, IT system, I think that will that will help a lot. So here, I think uh, governance means at least for procurement. Of course, it goes beyond procurement, also adhering to other principles of you know um, uh, accountability, and also for example, we have uh, audit reports. You know, the Auditor General reports. Mm. Uh, there are service uh, annual service reports. There are deficiencies identified in all those. So there has to be mechanisms to address those uh, deficiencies. Now, even in the, uh, the, the crisis that we are facing now in the uh, pharmaceutical you know, supplies and other uh, supplies in the health sector, these deficiencies have been identified repeatedly by the Auditor General every year. Yeah. Sadly, that th those have not been addressed. So, I think uh, the uh, uh, rectifying these uh, deficiencies in the procurement uh, system and then having all the technical evaluations done very objectively, not influenced by you know outsiders. I think that's critical. Sure, and and you spoke of the importance of proactive disclosures. The right to information is constitutionally enshrined, so we can also use perhaps 
um, technology to very simply uh, make these make this information available to the public absolutely and even if you look at the the drug information systems that are there right. now in M nmri i think you know it's a very well known story there had been a system which was introduced spending millions of uh, you know public money but it it was uh, dysfunctional uh, now we have of course the other medical supplies uh, division has uh, has a system and you can online see uh, which drugs are not available at the moment but uh, the the reliability and also um, how updated this uh, this uh, this information is uh, a bit doubtful because uh, now the it systems are there even in a remote hospital if the pharmacy is lacking uh, a particular medicine then it will be notified and you know there, there is a system uh, to place the orders because sometimes it takes more than six months for a particular drug to be manufactured and uh, uh, you know tr um, delivered to to hospital hospitals so i i think uh, we we really need to automate our system so that there is no um, personal physical contact in yeah. in uh, uh, procurement uh, dealings that will reduce the corruption drastically absolutely mm. yeah um let's also speak about the role of the public in holding uh, the government, the state to account. Why must people get involved in this process? Right. So, uh, Sonali, now you, if you, you referred to earlier the, uh, you know, some hospitals being closed down, some units. Now, yes. if you look at some of the statistics that have been uh, 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 published by the uh, Government Medical Officers Association, there are hospitals, smaller hospitals, which have already been closed down. At, actually, this, this was a development that happened very recently. Uh, they, are, they are primary medical care institutions. That means that is the first point of contact for most people. Mm -hmm. So, we have a tendency, of course, because they do not have all the facilities and people bypass these primary care institutions and go to what we call the tertiary care hospitals, the district general hospitals and so on. Or come all the way to Colombo, you know, but now people cannot afford that because their transport uh, cost has uh, uh, increased uh, and so on. So, now there are about uh, more than uh, 10, uh, 12 hospitals, uh, primary care units which have been closed down, which is very unfortunate and never happened in the history of the country, even during the time of the war, uh, even in North and East, most of these uh, medical institutions were functioning. Then if you look at some of the uh, specialist units in, in uh, major hospitals, they are also being closed down. It could be the cardiac unit or because there are no uh, in anesthetists and you know, so it is a serious situation. So when you look at the total functioning of uh, the uh, system, public has a role to play. Now, this uh, st take for example, Polon Narua. Now, Polon Narua, primary medical care unit, uh, uh, Kakuluvela and uh, Kandakadu, both have been closed down. Now, the people in that area should hold the member of parliament from that area accountable. No? So, they, because he, he has to raise those issues in the parliament or what, in whatever the way. So, that is how the public should also raise their voice and then also, uh, you know, uh, right to information, they can, yeah, they can ask, you know, why uh, the, this uh, hospital is now closed down, how can, and also it is not just asking, pu putting the full responsibility on the government. There are also others who are helping now. Most hospitals uh, are being helped by philanthropists and, you know, local businesses, even uh, m donating medicines that they can't. Uh, uh, get through the central uh, procurement mechanism just to save lives. Yeah. Cancer drugs are not there. There are many essential drugs that are not available. So, we can we can find solutions, but the public involvement has to be there in an organized way. So, that is why while uh, public take the responsibility to also uh, be taking lot of precautions on your own health, you know, health promotion and prevention and all that, because you can't uh, rely totally on the health uh, curative health care system. Sure. So, that way public has a responsibility, but uh, uh, ensuring accountability definitely public has a role to play. All right. We are in conversation with Dr. Vinya Arya Ratna. We are going for a short commercial break. We will be right back. People's Platform.
ICC Men's Cricket World Cup India 2023 Match between Australia versus New Zealand Tomorrow at 1pm onwards Repeat telecast on TV1 2024 budget will design the future of the nation Says the President Public sector employees to receive an additional 10,000 rupees from January Pension payments and senior citizens' allowances to be increased. Borrowing limit to be increased by 3,450 billion rupees. It would be a challenge to discuss with the IMF and creditors any proposal to reduce the personal income tax, which is being paid by 20% of the population, says an annexure in the budget. Burden on the masses will not reduce. Dr. Harsha responds to Budget 2024. <laughs> Chairman of the Central Environment Authority, who was remanded on charges of bribery, granted bail. Sports Minister Roshan Ranasinghe lodges a complaint at the CID. Legendary Sri Lankan cricketer Aravinda De Silva inducted to the ICC Hall of Fame. David Cameron returns to UK government as Foreign Secretary. Good morning, Matya. Get those mouth on, not. I'm not. Come on. Let me make it rain. Mambuatari. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Neil Pabalo. Other. Ratri Naveta Sirasa Tilithirayin The People's Platform Welcome back. You're watching The People's Platform. We are in conversation with Dr. Vinya Ariratna, President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Um, Dr. Vinya, in Sri Lanka, we speak of um, a free health uh, system. However, the health system that we have isn't very patient-centric or patient-centered. Uh, and at times, um, we see the manner in which um, patients aren't really cognizant of healthcare as a right, as an entitlement. It's often looked at as a privilege. This um, attitude needs to be shifted. Speak to us about how problematic it is to be unaware of one's right to health and how we can go about shifting this mindset. Yeah, Sonali, I, I think it's a very, very pertinent and a very important uh, question. Now, when you say free healthcare system or free education for that matter, it is free at the uh, at the point of delivery, but somebody has to pay for that, no? I mean, ultimately, it's the public who we, we, we all pay for that, right? So, uh, then one issue is how are we going to continue to finance that kind of system? And very few countries in the world have that that kind of free healthcare system so it has evolved over the years and it has really produced results and you know outstanding results the health outcomes of the sri lanka medical care system is very well recognized i'm i mean compared to the countries which have a similar per capita income we are far ahead right but the thing is uh, because of this crisis and also bad governance and so many other factors now this free healthcare system but also this model healthcare system uh, is under serious uh, threat right so now uh, the uh, uh, 
the uh, question you asked about uh, the patients or people feeling that this is a uh, this is a right but it's something that they have to when they receive a service it can be of any standard and they have to just passively receive it because it is it's it's free i think this has to change and i am a, a strong uh, proponent of having a, a charter for patients rights and also responsibilities and we have been particularly SLMA for more than 30 years have been advocating for patients rights and uh, we hope that soon we will have a uh, patients charter uh, which outlines the rights of patients and uh, responsibilities as well but it's very it's going to be very challenging because um, there are many dimensions including you know legal uh, implications uh, for doctors and all, all those things so it's a complex thing but I think it's very important to ensure that uh, higher standards are maintained and also ethical standards. Now earlier there have been our system was governed by ideals, all professions were uh, governed by high ideals and we, we adhere to professional ethics whether it is in medical practice or legal practice or in media you know unfortunately we have seen a terrible deterioration of those values so earlier you need not bring in special legislations to safeguard the rights of patients or anything like that we as doctors take the hippocratic oath and it says you know do no harm first even if you don't do anything don't do a harm mm. first then you do the uh, something that's in the best interest of the patient then we have to safeguard the privacy, the confidentiality of information that the patient shares. So those are values that we cherish and it is uh, within the, that ethical framework that we practice. Due to so many external uh, you know, factors including private practice coming in and the economic constraints faced by everyone including the doctors, we have forgotten those values and ethics. So I think it's important that uh, in a situation like that to remind that there is a responsibility on the part of medical providers, healthcare service providers, as well as the recipients to adhere to, uh, to these uh, principles and uh, that can be in the form of a charter. So right to health, although it's not explicitly guaranteed in our constitution, I personally think it should be but uh, there are many counter arguments to that as well but I think it has been accepted that every individual uh, has a right to access the best of medical care that the country can afford so that's what uh, which is uh, now called universal uh, health care mm -hmm. UHC which is also in the uh, one of the 17 uh, uh, goals of the uh, sustainable development goals mm -hmm. and uh, so we have we are looking at what you call equity there has to be justice it's not that we can provide the quality of care that you find in a western country no everyone has uh, the, the uh, basic services can be affordable and accessible by every citizen of this country so I think that kind of a system existed in Sri Lanka and unfortunately we have deliberately undermined that system because of uh, bad governance so it's the responsibility of the public as well as the 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 people who run the healthcare system including the doctors to somehow restore that restore that confidence and on the part of the uh, patients also of the on the part of the public there is a very important role to play because uh, it's also their own health and not to uh, you know abuse the system uh, not to waste uh, the, the the treatments and uh, medicines that are, that are given to you you know so there there's a lot that we need to work on health what you call health literacy as well sure. so although we are conscious about our health sometimes we are really not literate about uh, certain things that affect your health and how we can reduce the burden on the healthcare mm -hmm. system. Now, if you, if I give another example, the number one cause of admissions to our hospital is what? It's injuries and uh, you know accident, accidents uh, and uh, injuries. You know, result. So, uh, which is un avoidable, avoidable. You know. And our hospitals take care of the patients very well, even after being admitted, uh, uh, you know, after a, a car accident or, or, or injury. The, the, the deaths, have, uh, deaths are not the, the first five, but uh, the admissions cost a lot. 
and that is a drain in the healthcare system. Drunk driving, you know, all these things, these are preventable things. So, I think that the public also has a very important role to play here. Mm -hmm. Um, the worst impacted by the health care crisis uh, are the vulnerable communities and this has a direct uh, interlinkage with um, food insecurity, malnourishment. How do you see this vicious cycle? Yes, so when when you are undernourished, then you are more vulnerable to infections, right? So it's a it's a vicious cycle where your immune system is weak, then you are subjected to infectious diseases and other forms of illnesses, right? So that is that's why uh, we can't afford to have our children and particularly pregnant mothers, lactating mo mothers, not having adequate nutrition. So, last two and a half years, I think we have seen uh, a, a decline in the nutrition levels uh, to the worst uh, of our children, particularly children under five, even school going children, not only school going children, we have reports where and we are also helping sometimes through the civil society organizations, the, the university students, I mean those who come from far away places, so they don't get a square meal. And we know that recent studies have uh, indicated that more than 6 million people are food insecure in Sri Lanka. Uh, during the last uh, three months we could see that. And also we have seen more than 50% of the population are what they what you call multidimensionally vulnerable, uh, you know, poor yeah. uh, poverty. So these are very alarming indicators and then uh, some of the, the impacts of this deprivation uh, is going to reflect in our indicators maybe two or three years down the line and it can also transmit to another generation. Say if a girl does not get, uh, young girl does not get uh, the adequate nutrition, her own growth is uh, affected. When she becomes a mother, she will uh, not be able to deliver a uh, ba healthy baby, right. you know, and that, that transmits to, that is what we call the intergenerational transmission of uh, undernutrition. So, I think it is a very alarming situation. So, we have to look at food security and for the for food security to in improve, the economy has to improve. So, economy has to always look at the vulnerable population that is why we need to have a social protection system. Mm -hmm. Even the IMF report uh, emphasizes on having a robust social protection system. So, until the economy improves and those people who are in poverty uh, they need to come up and they need to also secure a, a sustainable economic uh, uh, well-being at some point but they should be supported. So, that is why there is a massive effort even from the civil society, professional colleges to look after these vulnerable uh, groups. My final question Dr. Vinya, uh, what is the role of the Sri Lanka Medical Association in working alongside other stakeholders including and not limited to the government to ensure that Sri Lanka is able to avert this health crisis? Yes, so uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association is a is an apex body of all doctors in Sri Lanka, those who are working in the government sector, the private sector, academia, non-government sector. So, it is a representative body and we are a professional medical organization where we could uh, quickly uh, pass on new knowledge updates to doctors. So, for the last two years uh, or even beyond, uh, we have been updating the uh, knowledge of doctors and also introducing protocols to function in a resource constrained environment. Uh, so, so that is an important role that we played and uh, even if there are no, no uh, shortages of medicines, how to manage with the existing supplies of medicines without of course compromising the uh, standard of care that has happened uh, because we know sometimes there is over prescription and even the pa patients would like more tests to be carried out on them and so, so we have uh, educated our, our membership and they have significantly contributed. Then the professional colleges, there are now Sri Lanka Medical Association, it is an uh, apex body, there are other professional colleges which are uh, specialized in different fields. So, they have been also mobilizing resources, philanthropic uh, donations, drug donations and then really going out of their way and even to cover up for say like certain hospitals do not have specialists. So, the specialists from a neighboring you know district will go 
they are and then okay. uh, you know somehow attend to patient that's the sacrifice that the, the specialist doctors and the members of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and other associations really made so I think they have contributed significantly and we'll, we are committed and we have also analyzed certain uh, issues in the health sector that's why I said that the outset that we have identified what are the shortcomings and the solutions are there so it's up to the leaders to implement the administrators to implement those and create the space because we have uh, enough and more you know honest and competent administrators uh, they should they should be able to operate independently and be able to address those issues and i think collectively we can if we really make a effort uh, we can make a change okay fantastic thank you very much dr vimya aryaratna thank you for watching us we'll see you again tomorrow good night